Mine's now on vibrate. If you could make yours as well, I would appreciate it. And we'll get started in just a few seconds. Thanks.
I'll just sit here. I'll sit here right now. on our board. All right, I think we're ready to go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Miller Center and to today's forum. I'm Barbara Perry. I direct presidential studies here at the Miller Center and uh, co-chair with my colleague Russell Riley the Presidential Oral History Program. We want to give a special welcome to our Governing Council, which is having its spring meeting. This is the highlight, perhaps, I would like to say, of the spring meeting, or at least the culmination uh, of our spring meeting. So we're grateful to them. They give so much support to us. Uh, and it, there wouldn't be a Miller Center without our Governing Council. So thank you so much for being here. I am just delighted to welcome Joan Biskupic, uh, an author, journalist, and media commentator. Uh, and she certainly is known as a renowned expert on the US Supreme Court. And I consider Joan one of my court friends. I think that would make you an amicus curiae, Joan. <laughs> um, because um, I have known her personally since my year as a judicial fellow at the Supreme Court in the mid-1990s. But I knew, and I'm not sure she even knows this, I knew uh, and valued Joan's work long before that. Um, after receiving her undergraduate degree from Marquette uh, and an MA from the University of Oklahoma uh, in English, and then her JD from Georgetown Law, uh, she began covering the court uh, for Congressional Quarterly. And that was at about the same time that I was beginning my scholarly career uh, as a presidency and Supreme Court scholar, having worked with the great Henry Abraham here at the University of Virginia. So I was already relying on Joan's work. I was relying on her work at Congressional Quarterly uh, in her articles and in her yearbooks on the US Supreme Court, which I just found invaluable uh, because her knowledge of the court and her access to it was just unparalleled. She had this up close and, and personal relationship with the Supreme Court and increasingly so with the justices, as you will see when we talk today. Um, though Joan left then Congressional Quarterly. She went on to write for the Washington Post, for USA Today, and to become an editor for Reuters. And now she is the Supreme Court analyst for CNN. So many of you probably know her from her commentaries on camera. And you also might know her from Washington Week, because she would increasingly uh, participate in their roundtable discussions uh, if there was a, an appointment coming up or a big case at the Supreme Court. And of course, that's on uh, PBS. So to my delight, in the midst of her career, Joan branched out to write judicial biographies, which I love. I love all biographies, but I particularly love judicial biographies. So she has written biographies of Sandra Day O'Connor, Antonin Scalia, Sonia Sotomayor, and now the chief, John Roberts. And it is available to you today in the ante room. We are very delighted to have the UVA bookstore here. They are taking a break from selling national championship t-shirts. <laughs> occasionally selling a book, and today it will be to sell Jones. I have read it from cover to cover. It is a great read and makes a wonderful graduation gift, Mother's Day gift, and certainly Father's Day gift. Um, Joan is going to give a brief overview of how she decided to write this book and what stories to tell, particularly at the beginning of the book. And then we'll sit for, oh, 20, 30 or minute, 20 or so, 30 minutes, and talk about some specific topics related to uh, Chief Justice Roberts' career in public service and at the Supreme Court. We'll talk about issues, we'll talk about appointments, and then we'll leave plenty of time, 20 minutes or so, for you to uh, ask your questions. So please be formulating those. And with that, please give a warm Miller Center welcome to my dear friend, Joan Thank you, Barbara, and thanks to all of you here. I actually visited the Miller Center for a few of my earlier books, mm -hmm. beginning with uh, Justice O'Connor, and actually, Barbara, 
I remember you even hosted me down at um, at Sweetbriar. Uh, Sweetbriar. Yes, I, I did. So let's hear it for women's colleges. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Holland Sweetbriar. <laughs> So today I want to start with a letter that I rep reproduce at the beginning of the book that gives you an immediate sense of my subject and then talk briefly about three episodes in his adult life that I reported out behind the scenes to figure out how to open the whole book. But this is how I open his life in the book. It's December 22nd, 1968. John Roberts is 13 years old, living in northern Indiana and he wants to attend a very new, very elite boarding school that is opened up for all boys. It's a Catholic lay school. And he writes to the headmaster, Dear Mr. Moore, the main reason I would like to attend La Lumiere School is to get a better education. I've always wanted to stay ahead of the crowd, and I feel that the competition at La Lumiere will force me to work as hard as I can. At an ordinary high school, it would probably be easy to stay ahead. I realize that going to La Lumiere will be a lot of study and hard work, but I feel confident that these labors will pay off in large amounts when it comes time to apply for admission to college. And then he closes. I am sure that by attending and doing my best at La Lumiere, I will assure myself a fine future. I won't be content to get a good job by getting a good education. I want to get the best job by getting the best education. Sincerely yours, John Roberts, Jr. Now, I use this letter because of the themes in it are seen throughout his adult life. My book devotes chapters to his life and education, vote switches in the Affordable Care Act, his positions on race, and his current position as Chief Justice with Kennedy's retirement, Justice Kennedy's retirement. And Barbara and I will be discussing those, but I think for this opening part, I want to bring you behind the scenes and explain the narrative I wanted to construct and the various shifts I had to make because of what was happening at the Supreme Court. I began this book in late, late, 19, uh, late 2015 when Justice Scalia was still alive and Anthony Kennedy was in charge. I should also say though that I actually, even though I started in earnest because I had gotten a book contract then in um, uh, early 2016, I had actually been reporting this book, sort of unbeknownst to me, as I was doing the Scalia biography, the Sandra Day O'Connor biography, and the Sotomayor political history. With her, I didn't do a straight biography. It was more of the history of her, her appointment. Um, but so I begin, as I'm sort of figuring out how I want to structure this, I want to think of key moments that might be, exemplify his life. And I thought in the beginning, something to focus on was his sense of control, his effort at control when Justice Kennedy was still there. And one day in early 2015, I'm sitting in the courtroom and I feel like I get exactly the scene I want. It, I'm going to bring you back to January 21st, 2015. Justices are arguing a Fair Housing Act case and suddenly there's pandemonium in the room. And as most of you know that that play, anybody who's been up there knows how hushed the atmosphere is. People have to check their cell phones and any electronic devices. Any whispering is stopped immediately. But suddenly people start shouting, money out of politics, reverse Citizens United. Turns out it was the five-year anniversary of the court's ruling in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. And the activists were protesting that decision that had lifted federal regulations on corporate and labor union spending. And they were all working together. And frankly, the, the Supreme Court courtroom feels as intimate as this setting. And can you imagine if you were up here on this bench and suddenly people started popping up? It, again, in this place where nobody says anything but the lawyers who are arguing and the justices. And they're working together and they're saying, you know, they're, they're exclaiming these, these protests of defiance. And the chief is going, there, here's one, there, there's another one. <laughs> and so it's, it's just complete pandemonium. And I'm thinking, this is an excellent anecdote to use uh, with these leaders of, grass, turns out they were leaders of the grass, it turns out they were leaders of the grassroots movement, 99, called the 99 Rise, representing you know, the 99% uh, who don't control the way the 1% the uh, control. And they were m all muscled out of the courtroom. And it was, it was just very disruptive. And the chief was so disturbed by it. And, at, and I discovered later in interviewing these people, they had rehearsed the night before, they had figured out how to sneak through all the electronic um, uh, 
monitoring. They'd even used a pen to film some of this. So uh, a little camera in the pen. Anyway, <laughs> the, the chief finally gets it, um, gets it subdued and he says, we will now continue our tradition of having open court at the Supreme Court. And he could barely suppress his, his anger. And I talked to the justices afterward as I flushed out this scene and they were saying, it was so unnerving not to know how many people were out there, who was, who was in, working in cahoots and who wasn't. So I think, okay, this will be my prologue. This will be my prologue that will talk about, you know, how the justice struggles for control, not just with the people and in public view, but also with Justice Kennedy, who is this centrist conservative controlling. But then on February 13th, 2016, shortly after I had decided to write this book, the court world was turned upside down. That was when Justice Scalia's body was found in this remote ranch in Texas. He's dead. And suddenly, John Roberts' fate is really changed because we all believe, at least at that point in February of 2016, that Barack Obama is going to be able to appoint Justice Scalia's successor. So I had this new moment for this defining prologue, and I'm, I decided to track down where everybody was at that moment on February 13th, 2016. And some of you might even remember when you found out that Justice Scalia had died. I certainly remember. <laughs> so I, it's easy, the court doesn't tell you, I should, I should observe, where anybody is when they're in their off hours. They do it, they don't, they're worried about security, but they're just, it's just an institution that doesn't want to tell you anything, frankly. <laughs> so they don't tell you where people are. So I knew that the, the chief had somehow been in Florida and likely in Miami, but I didn't know exactly where and with whom. So I, I figure, I can figure out, I can start figuring out where everybody is uh, because they had just been at the start of a, a little recess. So I thought, well, some of them probably were on vacation. So I, I find out that Justice Ginsburg that night had been getting ready to go to the opera at the Kennedy Center. Justice Kagan was going to join her, but she had gone to the Supreme Court first to read some briefs. Justice Thomas was working at his home in uh, rural Virginia, and he, I found out exactly who he had called immediately, which clerks he had gotten in touch with. I just, I just placed everyone, and I, I figured out who, which justices found out through the court's internal mechanisms, and who were down for, far enough in the, in the seniority ranks that they had to find out from TV <laughs> and how mad they were about that. So, you know, I got, I got this great scene, but I still didn't know what was going on with the chief. And I thought, I will find out. I've got many months on this book, but I will find out. So I, I, went about, I started going about other research and interviews. And even though I couldn't pin down where the chief was, I started, you know, just exploring his background, more of the background that we'll talk about today. You know, uh, people who had been in law school at Harvard with him, uh, people who had worked in judicial clerkships with him. And one man that I decided to follow up with is, was a fellow by the name of Dean Colson, who had been a law clerk for then Associate Justice William Rehnquist when John Roberts was there, and had become so close to the Chief, Chief Justice Roberts, that he had been his best man in his wedding. So I decided, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna call Dean Colson. He's down in Miami, and I'm gonna find him. And I'm, I'm talking to him about what he remembers first of John Roberts, how youthful he looked when he was, you know, in his mid-20s for a clerkship. But he, uh, Dean tells me that he had known that he had, you know, had this great uh, position on the law review and he had earlier worked for uh, the esteemed appellate court judge, Henry Friendly. And he tells me, you know, what he thinks of Jane, who, you know, he had been at the wedding. And as we're talking, I say, when was the last time, how often do you still see John Roberts? And he said, oh, I see him regularly. And suddenly, it, I should say that I called him at his Coral Gables office. So, you know, I'm thinking Coral Gables, I'm thinking Florida. And suddenly I think, I'll just ask. And I just said, what was it like, after he's kind of bragged a touch about seeing John Roberts so much, <laughs> I, said, I said, well, then what was it like the night he was there and you found out about Justice Scalia's death? <laughs> and he says, it was stunning. <laughs> everything, everything came to a stop. He was in shock. It was unbelievable. And in the back of the mind, my mind, I'm thinking, this is definitely my prologue, <laughs> because I suddenly, I suddenly, you know what it's like. You know, I mean, it's, it's the chase. The chase of getting these things is so exciting. So, you know, I knew this was a court-altering, life-altering moment, and suddenly I knew what was going on. And they had just golfed. I found out that he was there with his with wife Jane and daughter Josie. Uh, son Jack was still off at boarding school. So I'm like, oh, this is great. So this that gets me then to the end of 2016. I'm into 2017. I'm starting to face my deadlines for producing this book. And just so everybody knows, 
The, um, the lead time for producing this book is almost like a year where you have to submit it. It's frankly ridiculous. <laughs> but, you know, because so much is happening. There's just so much happening at the Supreme Court. But I, so I start writing this tale, and I find out what's, I, meanwhile, with my other reporting, I find out about two switches in the Affordable Care Act case. I'm putting together all of his themes that run from, in his life on his racial um, attitudes from when he was with the Reagan administration up to his position in the center chair. And I'm, you know, I'm working on this. I'm getting ready. I'm facing a lot of deadlines, but, you know, so much is happening at the Supreme Court and in Washington because Donald Trump has been elected. And even though my, um, my original idea of Scalia's death was to say the chief suddenly has a will have a majority that's of an opposite ideology. That, of course, doesn't happen because of Mitch McConnell and no vote on Merrick Garland, but that's still nicely part of the tale. That becomes, you know, still a good part of my story. And, you know, of course, we're hearing rumors that Justice Kennedy might be thinking about retirement, but I'm thinking to myself, oh, he wouldn't give up that position of power. And I'm also thinking, I can't handle any more drama. You know, I've <laughs> got to finish this book. But we all know what happens on June 27th, 2018 at 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. For all sorts of reasons, Justice Kennedy announces that he's retired. And even as I'm immediately having to talk about this on television and immediately having to write analyses about how the Supreme Court is now just not John Roberts in name, but in reality, because he doesn't have to maneuver with Justice Kennedy anymore as a centrist, I'm thinking, but what about my book? Because by, <laughs> at this point, I have had to hand in the, the manuscript, and the manuscript opens with this prologue about the, this night in February 13, 2016. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, but we've just had this, this earthquake of news with Kennedy's retirement, which is going to affect the law across the board. And we can talk about that, but you know, it, I'm sure all of you who followed the Supreme Court have realized that Justice Kennedy for three decades was essentially the voice of where the law turned out. So I'm thinking, I'm still thinking, no, the book will be fine with that prologue, and I'm, I'm changing the very end of the book, you know, because of Justice Kennedy's retirement. And I should tell you that my publisher was already very angry at the fact that I was pushing my deadlines because of all the news happening in Washington. And, you know, they had already put the manuscript into production because we had set this early 2019 uh, deadline, and again, you know, it's about a year out. So, you know, I'm, I'm worried about Brett Kavanaugh's nomination. I'm worried about how to craft the end of the book. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, oh, well, that, well, that opening that sets the tone, should I be referring to 2016 rather than what has just happened? So I'm, I'm, what a lot of authors do is they send um, copies of the manuscript to friends for, um, you know, for some insights and to ch get checked on certain chapters. And a friend of mine down at the University of Texas said, you know, I know you cover everything that's changed in that last chapter, but opening with Scalia's death, I just think might not capture things. And I thought, this is in August, August. And, you know, by now everybody's, you know, like things are starting to really be set in stone. And I, I and my, as I said, my publisher was just so impatient with me saying, you know, for goodness sakes, Justice Kennedy has left him more in the middle. And then we have all the turmoil of the Kavanaugh hearings. But I'm, I'm thinking, no, I can, you know, you're fighting with yourself. And so it, this friend had said, you know, you ought to just see if you can change that prologue. And I'm, I'm kind of tiptoeing around it. And the next day, and I have lunch with a, a, with a justice. And uh, as Barbara rightly observed, I do have very good access to the justices. And this was a justice who I'd used as a sounding board at various points. And at this point, I say, this is how, you know, this is how I ended up structuring the, the book. Here are some of the chapters, just to let you know what I ended up with. And this is how I opened the book. And I just explained again what I had learned about that pivotal evening from all nine about what was going on. And I just blurt out, as I'm saying it, I say, I cannot open the book that way. I go back to my, I finish our lunch, I go back to my office, I type a note to my publisher, and I say, I'm changing it. I don't even say, you know, like, I, do I want permission? I just say, I'm changing it, and I'm going to give it to you in 48 hours. I decide to kind of, like, soften the blow. <laughs> because you can't, here's the other thing I, I also say, Barbara, I say, I will not change the page count. Because that's the other thing that drives them all crazy. You know, like, oh, God. you know, like, it will, it will drive our production team crazy. I say, I will not change the page count. I will, I will work it all in. And, I, and then, as a tease, I say, here's what I learned. And I decide to tell them, and I say how, you know, um, at 10 a.m., the justices, you know, ascend the bench on this June 27th morning. 
They read these historic opinions, one in that, uh, a big labor case where they divide five to four, and you, know, you hear of Justice Alito quarreling with Justice Kagan, and it's, it's just a, a big dramatic moment, but the voice you don't hear at all is Anthony Kennedy, which is quite unusual because he's almost always the, uh, you know, someone who speaks from the bench on the last day, and in the audience is Mary Kennedy, his wife of all these years, who he, they met when they were teenagers in Sacramento, and she's got her, some of her grandchildren with them. But most of his colleagues and the audience think that since he didn't announce anything from the bench, that you know he's staying. You know the, the liberals are thinking, "Phew, we dodged a bullet." But then they go into their private conference room without any clerks or secretaries there with them. They do some lingering business, and then the chief turns to Anthony Kennedy and says, "Tony," and that's when he reveals it. The liberals are thunderstruck. The chief had known, but the others hadn't, and they realize as he's speaking that they can't talk him out of it, that he's just feeling like he's had enough. You know, he was about to turn 82 at the time. They offer handshakes and hugs all around. Then they go off to a luncheon, and um, Justice Kennedy breaks away to go tell Donald Trump personally. He rides over there not with the chief, but with the chief's top aide. And, you know, I, cl I, I say, you know, this is, this is going to be such a moment for um, the Chief Justice who lingers at the lunch table with his colleagues. So I'm, I'm trying to give everybody you know, enough to hang their hat on. Mm -hmm. And they, they say, okay, fine. But then for my purposes, then I need a moment, then I have to figure out after I've laid this all out, how do I transition back to Scalia's death? Because I'm not giving up all of that. <laughs> I'm, gonna give up, I'm gonna give up some of it, but I'm not giving up all of it. And here's how I handled it, I say, the turn of events that late June morning represented a dramatic reversal from what had appeared to be John Roberts' fate only two years earlier after a separate startling occurrence. At that point, Roberts could have assumed that he and the other conservative justices would be in the minority on the court for the foreseeable future. That news had come during a February recess in 2016 and reverberated for many months. It was the Saturday of, President's Day, of the President's Day weekend, and Roberts had been playing golf and relaxing with a friend in Miami. And then I tell what happened, and I go, then I go back to the beginning, and I use all of this to show the very fortunate life of a man who, even as a boy, always wanted to stay ahead of the crowd and didn't want just a good job. He wanted the best job. I hope you enjoyed the book, and now we'll go through more, but with <laughs> Barbara's probing questions. <laughs> Thank you, Joan, so much. You can see why, as soon as I got back to Sweetbriar from the court, Joan was among the first people I called. We did a whole forum. It was called Winter Forums in those days, and Sally might be uh, familiar with these from Agnes Scott, but these were a centerpiece of women's colleges. We'd have these types of forums, of course. Uh, and I called Joan, and she was a big hit with both our, our audience uh, of students and, and people in the community. You can also see why, much more recently, Joan was a Pulitzer Prize finalist for explanatory writing, uh, because she just has this tremendous gift of storytelling, and that makes a great book, to be sure. Now, at the Miller Center, Joan, you know that uh, one of the things that we focus uh, on in our mission is the presidency. So in my uh, questions to, to Joan and the topics that we'll cover, I want to bring together sure. the Supreme Court and the presidency, which you've already done to some extent, because of course presidents are involved both in appointments, to be sure, but also their policies mm -hmm. that come to the court because they're challenged, and we might be seeing some more of that. Uh, as we learned this week with uh, executive privilege, for example, um, possibly being questioned all the way to the Supreme Court. So with that as, as a uh, focus and as a preface, um, can you start us off on uh, John Roberts? You started us off on his academic career with your comments, but can you start us down the road of his public service? Uh, sure. His early clerkships, you mentioned uh, with Judge Friendly on the circuit court, but then with then Associate Justice Rehnquist, but also his work in the Solicitor General's office during the Reagan years in the Justice Department. Sure, and uh, he was actually, in, uh, early on he was uh, in the Department of Justice and the White House Counsel's Office for Reagan, and then in the Solicitor General's Office for H.W. Bush. So he, uh, at, you know, he's first in his class at the boarding school at La Lumiere. Uh, he's the first student to go off to Harvard and from that school, and he finishes Harvard undergrad in three years, goes right into law school, 
wins all sorts of honors for his writing ability. He's a fabulous writer, you know, always top of his class. And from Harvard, he goes to clerk for uh, Judge Friendly, who was, is regarded as one of the greatest judge, appeals court judges of his generation, uh, based in New York. And he's, uh, it's interesting, I draw a contrast between the sort of moderate conservatism, more of an intellectual conservatism of Judge Friendly, and the strong, successful agenda conservatism of William Rehnquist, who was sort of proud of what he was able to do at the Supreme Court in terms of planting the seed for um, his ideology when he was an associate justice, and John Roberts was one of his clerks, and then when he became chief in 1986. And while he's working for Justice Rehnquist, finishing up his term 1980-81, he's wondering what to do next. And he hears Ronald Reagan's inaugural speech in January of 1981, and he says, I heard the call. I felt that this is where I wanted to work. His boss, Bill Rehnquist, calls a man by the name of Ken Starr, then working for <laughs> Attorney General William French Smith. And I do have to say, it is a pleasure to look out at this audience and know that some of you will know all these names. <laughs> when, I, when, when I am with other people, they're like, who was William French Smith and who? Ken Starr, Ken Starr, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you know the players. And they've been, this is the thing, the same players, they've been with us, and they, you know, they, life you know, continues with so many key figures in Washington, including somebody who we worked uh, for, Fred Fielding, uh, who's been around forever and such a student of the presidency also. Uh, so he, he then, um, through Bill Rehnquist and Ken Starr, he gets this job, initially working for William French Smith in the Department of Justice, and seizes that. It's, it's amazing, the memos he writes, where he has very definite ideas about being part of the Reagan agenda, and he writes a note to Henry Friendly, his mentor, saying, it is such an exciting time where everything that was taken for granted is now being questioned. So he's all in on the, um, the conservative revolution. You know, he, as I, I mentioned in my opening, he had a wonderful sense of timing throughout his life. He didn't like the liberalism at Harvard, but just as he's going out in the real world, obviously conservatism is in ascendancy because Ronald Reagan's been elected. So he works uh, in the Reagan years for about five years, uh, his Reagan tenure is about five years, first in the Department of Justice and then in the White House Counsel's Office. Then he goes briefly off to private practice and then returns in the H.W. Bush administration. And that's when he's Deputy Solicitor General, working for Ken Starr, who at the time was Solicitor General. And again, uh, taking, uh, becoming sort of the, the very smart mind behind a lot of political positions. He has an excellent sense of the right arguments to make, uh, obviously super smart about things, and he's, he's the architect for a lot of the uh, legal rationales uh, against uh, racial remedies such as campus affirmative action for narrowing the, the scope of the Vi Voting Rights Act. He uh, is part of uh, positions that would be to narrow the right to abortion, if not overturn it. These are all things that he did that he uh, was quite adept at and was not so much high on the radar with, but enough that, Barbara, you'll remember, the very first time he was actually nominated to go on a court was in 1992 when he was still with the George H.W. Bush administration. Uh, he was nominated for the D.C. Circuit and Joe Biden, another name in the news, especially today, <laughs> Joe Biden, who was Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman at the time, did not even allow him a hearing because his staffers knew what John Roberts was doing behind the scene, even though he was hardly any kind of a household name. Right, right. Well, thank you for that. Now, obviously, he arrives in Washington, as you say, from Harvard, where he's in a liberal milieu, he's a conservative. Where does that conservatism come from? You, you've studied now so closely his life and his early life and his family situation. Where does he get that conservatism? You know, he had a background that's not unlike many other people, but it was, he, you know, growing up in a, a, a Catholic, well-off home in Northern Virginia. His father was in the steel industry. Uh, and what I do with some of those markers is not say that they were necessarily soul-defining, but he never broke away from them. He liked the, his father was very much in an established profession that was built on hierarchy. The steel industry, when uh, John Roberts Sr. was on, in it, uh, he was known by Jack, Jack Roberts, his dad, uh, was very much part, uh, tradition reigned, uh, 
uh, hierarchy reigned, and John Roberts started in at Bethlehem Steel. Jack Roberts, the father, started at Bethlehem Steel right out of college himself, from the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, the one thing, the only thing I would say about his ascension, uh, the father's ascension in the industry, was that it happened to be when the industry was failing. You know, he as he was rising, becoming a top executive, it was when steel was having so much trouble in America. And one of the troubles steel was having was all the Department of Justice oversight on uh, racial remedies in, in the workplace. So there were a lot of struggles there that the Sun observed. The Sun observed all the counting of women and minorities that was so prevalent at Harvard in the 70s when um, the Civil Rights Act was first being enforced. So he saw, he saw some of those tensions, but he was, he never left kind of the, um, I think in terms of mentally, they kind of drive for institutionalism, conservatism. Uh, he, he, he believed in that. And I, I'm one of the people who resist some of the, uh, actually we've talked about the Catholicism thing because you've written about that. I tend to resist that as a, a definite marker for these justices in part because of Bill Brennan being a Catholic who, you know, was for all sorts of abortion and reproductive rights. But then also Sonia Sotomayor was also raised a Catholic. So I don't divide it as neatly, but it's true that the most conservative justices do come from that kind of background. So when Joan and I talked about this, when I first began to study Catholics on the court, they, they, were, they fell into the three elements of the spectrum. So Justice Brennan, a Catholic, was very liberal. Justice Scalia, a Catholic, was very conservative, and Justice Kennedy, a Catholic, the three that were on at that time fell right in the middle of the political spectrum. So I, I take Joan's point. I was, I was always interested in how that had an impact on their church and state cases, and That's right. we'll, we'll talk about that in, yeah. in a moment. And just, just to reinforce what you've written on this, Justice, uh, the Chief Justice Roberts would be much more like a Justice Scalia. Right, so he's I'm, a conservative. Yes in politics and judicial ideology and in his Catholicism, exactly as is right. his wife. Yes, right. yes, right, excellent. Um, so tell us about um, his time out of public service in the Clinton years. So when Clinton comes into office yeah. in 93, uh, obviously he's not going to get his seat on the court at that point from no. the Bush 41 administration. Uh, he goes into private practice and becomes not only viewed, I think, as, as the le great legal mind of his generation, but a great Supreme Court advocate. What's he learning? He is amazing. He is actually a fairly shy individual in terms of his personality. And he also had a, would always have a terrible case of nerves uh, at, at college, he was always with a bottle of Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> he, before he would stand up to argue, his hands would shake. But this is the amazing thing. He overcame all that for this very public presence. And he, his preparation for arguing his cases before the court was so obviously effective. But he, he worked very, very hard. And his wife, Jane Roberts, told me that when they were dating, at one point she realized how serious things were going, at least in his mind, when he actually agreed to go out in the two week period before an argument. Because he usually <laughs> would just so, so completely hole up and do nothing. And friends said, wow, he must really like you if he's gonna even talk to you during that period. And so, but, but he, preparation was everything and he, he's obviously an excellent reader and could digest material. And what he would say is that he would, he would learn a case inside and out, but then he wanted to be very conversational and uh, present as if he was talking to his three sisters. When he grew up, he was a uh, family of four. He was the only boy, and he had these three sisters, none of whom uh, went to law school. But they, so he, he li and he liked to tell a story somewhere within, the, within his legal argument that would resonate in, in the just, justices or judges' minds. Speaking of his wife, Jane, you, you said in the book, and as well as in interviews about the book, that she is much more outgoing and oh. extroverted than he, so that in your interviews with her, you got a lot of information. So t compare and contrast the two personalities, and what did you learn from him in your interviews with him? Okay, so th they took place under completely different terms. With the chief, I was not able to record them, and they were, um, he let me come see him eight times, the ground rules were most of them, most of the material was off the record, but we would negotiate over what I could use. Uh, so I, you know, I, I was willing to do whatever terms he would say. He in the end said that he ended up cooperating far more than he anticipated, but he was nothing like Justice Scalia, who granted me 12 on the record interviews all taped. So that was, <laughs> that was very different. But with Jane, uh, 
she, they, they were on the record, and I brought two tape recorders, because another thing is you don't want, if you finally get somebody to talk on the record, you don't want anything to go wrong. So, um, <laughs> and, and just in terms of manner, Jane, uh, first of all, just so you know her background, uh, she also a lawyer, but she came from a, a first generation Irish family, grew up in the Bronx. She, I think she was the first person in her family to go to college. She's uh, quite scrappy, worked her way up, did not have a lot of the advantages that her husband had. And uh, both of them married when they were 41. So they married late, their only marriages. Uh, when, I would, when I would talk to some of his pals about, uh, you know, did it strike you as unusual? that uh, he married late, you know, they had their different ideas. And I said, well, what year did you marry? And out of a couple of them, they would say, what, which time? <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was, was a good sign of the times. So he spared himself the first divorce, yeah. Which, but anyway, he, um, so Jane, Jane would often use a phrase, that's just who we are, that's just who I am. And that was almost, because she's very proud of what they're all about. You know, she's very, she's incredibly proud of her Irish background. Uh, her name was Jane, Jane Sullivan. Very proud of that background. Very proud of what she's done. And, you know, just would talk openly about the family's adoptions, talk openly about everything in her life. And the chief... You know, I'd say, well, I remember that you, you know, I'd say something to the effect of, I remember you said publicly that you wanted, um, you wanted to be a PhD in history at first. Did I say that? You know, like, <laughs> hey, you know, there was always, I, you know, I, I always felt that I was fighting things and I would, I, you know, I would say, but I remember you said this. And I, I, I the poor man did run up against what, I do have an, a very good memory. And I <laughs> have been following him for more than 20 years, nearly 30 years, because I was, just, I was working at Congressional Quarterly in the Washington Post when he was arguing cases. And his very first case before the justices in January of 1989 was right when I was starting to cover the court full time. So I have followed him and he'd say, no, that's, he, he would reject some assertion. And again, I don't wanna be, I don't wanna explain what those were. He would re reject an assertion, then I'd go back to my notes and I'd look it up and I'd think, no, this is right. So I'd type this letter, dear chief, you know? Like, <laughs> I went back and I looked, but he, his, uh, there were many reasons he had for not wanting to, to fully cooperate. And his overriding one, I believe, is that he thinks that individual justices are not defined by their backgrounds. He, he really thinks that he can separate, he separates whatever came before for a neutral look at what the law says. And, you know, I believe he believes that. And so he, he has that, and he also, he just is, again, in a more personal vein, not someone who likes to talk about himself, whereas Scalia loved talking about himself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's their story, and they're sticking to it in terms of, we, we, as he said in his confirmation hearings, I view myself as the umpire. Behind the, behind the home plate in a baseball game, I call the balls and the strikes as I see them. I may call them wrong, but I'm, I don't wear the uniform of one of the teams. I'm, I'm the umpire. I'm the neutral umpire. Tell us how he gets to the U.S. Supreme Court. Can you take us through that fascinating vetting process in the Bush 43 administration? And who else is con being considered? This is, again, his sense of timing makes all the difference in the world. During uh, George W. Bush's first term, he gets no appointments uh, to the Supreme Court. Nobody leaves, the court goes through an unusual 11 year period of stability. And uh, John Roberts during this time is, finally gets an appointment to the US Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit. And because George Bush puts him on that, in, he, he was nominated in 2001, eventually gets him con confirmed in 2003. There's a little bit of controversy over his nomination, but by then, he's kind of laundered his resume, working for different parties, and he's, he gets support from a lot of people in the Supreme Court bar across ideologies that really matters. And so he's on the DC circuit, and for the second round of interviews that George um, w. Bush's administration is doing, starting in the second term when Bill Rehnquist has thyroid cancer and is very ill, he suddenly, he finally gets an interview. His first interview is April 1st of 2005, when Justice, the Chief Justice Rehnquist is very ill and they're thinking, we definitely are finally going to have an opening. But by this point, Alberto Gonzalez, who's now Attorney General, and the others of the George uh, and Dick Cheney, who's vice president, they've, they've already been considering people like Michael Ludig from this area, um, uh, J. Harvey Wilkinson, another judge from this area. They're looking at them, they're looking at Samuel Alito, they're looking at judges who've been around for a while, not someone who's just been on an appeals court for two years, but because so much time has elapsed before any kind of opening, 
they think, all right, we might as well start talking to John Roberts. He's got this great reputation. He's seen as more moderate. People just don't know what he really did in the Reagan administration at this point because the memos weren't publicly avail uh, disseminated as they became. So when it turns out to be Sandra Day O'Connor who retires on July 1st, 2005, and not the chief, the chief thinks he can hold out for another year. He's, we discover he is dying of thyroid cancer at this point, but he's in denial himself thinking, I can hold out for another year. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, Justice O'Connor is struggling with her husband's Alzheimer's, and she's like, if he's not gonna go, I need to go. So she tells the White House that she's gonna go. And here's something interesting that happens. She, tell, they send a letter to, she sends a letter to Harriet Myers, who at the time is White House counsel. Harriet Myers calls uh, George, the president, George W. Bush, and says, we have a resignation. It's not who we thought it was going to be. It's uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. He starts to call a meeting. Alberto Gonzalez told me that when he got the call from Harriet Myers that it's not who they thought it was, he immediately hung up and went, over, went to go see Harriet Myers and the president. And I said, you didn't ask who it was who had retired? He said, no, I just left right away. And I thought, that can't be right. I'm not even going to print that. <laughs> that can't, I can't, it cannot be right that you would not ask, say, well, who? You know, it's not like there were hundreds of them. There were, only, you know, there were only that many. And I thought, well, you know, he might not be remembering the panic of the moment. But anyway, so what happens is now the Bush administration is looking not for someone to replace the chief, someone who's been around longer, like Jay Wilkinson or um, Michael Ludig, He's looking for someone who might be seen as more moderate, as Justice O'Connor was, and thinking, okay, we'll eventually get this other spot. So uh, George Bush ends up interviewing three finalists. One's John Roberts, one's Michael Ludig, and one's Sam Alito. And John Roberts rolls out the uh, umpire metaphor. He, you know, he talks about his judicial philosophy, he talks about his family, the two adopted children, and George, Bush writes that he felt like he saw a man with a gentle soul. You know, of course, John Roberts prepared mightily for that interview too, and that was he. You know, he he could represent himself as well as he could represent clients. So he gets nominated in mid July of 2005 for an associate justice's seat. Before the Senate can hold hearings, William Rehnquist dies on September 3rd, and. The timing of his death is crucial because it's right in the middle of the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, where the Bush administration is completely besieged by criticism over its handling of all the deaths and destruction in New Orleans. And remember the famous line that the president said, you're doing a heck of a job, Brownie. He's, you know, he gets so much hassle for, and you know, rightful criticism for all that's happening down there. So the morning after Rehnquist's death, President George W. Bush calls them all together and he just decides John Roberts has gotten such a good initial reaction. He doesn't want to even think about the idea that Dick Cheney had been suggesting, let's take a serious look about elevating Antonin Scalia. We need no more controversy. He just says, I'm going with John Roberts, we'll figure out the other one later. So that's how John Roberts finds out within 24 hours of his former mentor's death that he is going to be nominated to be Chief Justice. Amazing, amazing and, and at, at age 50, you, I'm sure you know this, Barbara, at age 50, he was the youngest Chief Justice, Chief Justice in more than 200 years, John Marshall was, and he, he had less experience than anybody else on the court at the time. Amazing. So you might have heard the, the Philip Graham statement, the, the publisher of the Washington Post, that journalism is the first draft and we like to think then that here in presidential oral history, we're the second cut. So as Joan is describing this story, I'm thinking we've interviewed all of those people you oh, mentioned, with, with the exception of the chief himself. So all the people who were behind the scenes and in front of the scenes in the Bush 43 administration, Russell Riley and I have interviewed them, and we'll, take that sec we'll get that second cut. And we hope to be releasing these uh, in November, so be, be looking. And that is, if these people have cleared their transcripts to release, if they've said, yes, you can release them, we will be releasing them come this November. Well, let me just ask in this audience, is there anything you found out that might change my idea of what happened? <laughs> Now that it's in print? Because these are confidential until release, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> well, then, well, then let's not. Let's wait till November. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so those, that will be a fabulous contribution. Thank you. We yeah. think so. We think That's so, great. and a great follow-on to all of the material yeah. that you've gathered okay. as well. Um, can we talk a little bit about issues? Sure. Once he gets to the court, you mentioned the ACA, also known as Obamacare. 
this is a fascinating story that only Joan in her book has really described beyond what anybody else knew about what happened behind the scenes on the vote on the Obamacare case. Okay, so they th hold three days of historic oral arguments back in March of 2012 over several facets of the Affordable Care Act. The one that's getting all the attention at the time is the individual mandate. That's the requirement that everybody buy insurance so that healthy people pay into the system so it's not just people when they're sick dragging down the system. That's the part that everybody's concerned about and that uh, lower courts had split on whether Congress was right to impose this, this individual mandate requirement under its power to regulate interstate commerce. That's kind of the main issue. But then there's also another major issue where, the court, where Congress had expanded the coverage for Medicaid and said states, all of you who take you know, nearly 100% of federal dollars, you know, it's in the 90 to 100% range for uh, Medicaid funding, you need to offer Medicaid to coverage to a broader group of people near the poverty line. So that would have brought in millions more people covered by insurance, which was the goal of the whole Affordable Care Act idea, is that you know, we want more people covered. So those are the two main things that um, are voted on in, in the Justice's private conference. But then there are, they also had to worry about you know, what, um, uh, you know, what provisions might also be invalidated if they invalidate any of these core ones. So the initial vote after their arguments is to strike down the individual mandate, that it doesn't, it doesn't meet the Constitution's requirement for interstate com for commerce power on Congress's part but to uphold the Medicaid expansion. And over the course then of several weeks, those votes get completely changed for the court to uphold the individual mandate on taxing grounds that they never even voted on in conference, but that the Chief Justice imposed on his majority opinion. And they switch votes on the Medicaid. So that part gets struck down with the idea being that Congress cannot, as John Roberts said, hold a gun to the state's head and say, if you want our funding, you have, to, um, you have to cover all these people. Now, Congress's spending power has, in other cases, been allowed to cover, to do something like that, to come with string, strings attached. And what I discovered is, after the chief cast his initial vote to strike down the whole thing, there was an issue among the justices on, and, and, and it, was a, it was the five conservatives voting against the four liberals. And when the liberals walked out of that initial private conference, they thought, they were so demoralized, they thought, the whole thing's going down. This is awful, you know, that it, because, because of how things were intertwined. Even though they knew that they had voted to uphold Medicaid, because of where Justice Kennedy was, Justice Kennedy believed that if they were going to invalidate one key portion, the whole thing had to sink, because Congress had not uh, explicitly written in what's known as the severability clause. And Justice Kennedy, the guy in the middle, was essentially controlling everything, and the chief, for many reasons, decided that he did not want to go that route. That it was an election year. Uh, you know, this was the signature uh, achievement, domestic achievement of Barack Obama. That there were just many other things in play, and that's he starts to write an opinion that will uphold it based on Congress's taxing power. And when the justices to his right do not want to negotiate with him, they just do not want to play. They become very angry at his switch. He then starts working with the two justices on the left who are closest to the center, Justice Stephen Breyer and Justice Elena Kagan. And they end up changing their votes on the Medicaid portion, essentially to give the chief something since he was giving the left something. So this becomes a, a big deal inside. Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor never waver from their position. They end up having to write a dissent on the Medicaid thing because they're like, no, no, oh, we, we, th we thought this would all be oh, fine. And then the, the conservatives who end up having to, uh, they end up having to write a dissent saying, not only of course would this, should this thing have fallen based on Congress's limited commerce power in their mind, but also based on the taxing power that the chief had sort of, it wasn't created out of whole cloth. The Obama administration had indeed argued that it could be upheld on the taxing power, but that, that angle was never, discussed in conference or voted on in their private conference. So um, the conservative justices were incredibly angry about this. And the whole episode I write in my book crystallized some distrust among the justices for the chief. To this day. 
to this, this day. day. That's one of the most intriguing chapters in the book because it not only shows you how the institution operates, it takes you behind the red curtain in the courtroom to see the intrigue and the, in a way, the, the horse trading that's, that's going yeah. on among them and the personalities and the ideologies. Just as a, an aside, I, had, uh, I, for reasons, I had predicted publicly that the chief would um, vote to uphold while this all was going on. I was one of the very few reporters who said that, but, but that's because I thought, I thought I know what's really important to him. I know race is an issue for him. I know, but I think that on something like this and that election year, I just thought he would go for the institutional and the, you know, worried about the court's stature. But I ended up being wrong because he initially did vote to strike it down. <laughs> but I remember when all, the, there were some rumors based on the fact that um, Jan Crawford, who was, uh, I yeah, she was with CBS at the time, had found out that um, about the conservative anger about what the chief did. So she knew part of the story. And when she wrote that, I said, I said, when people were saying, oh, he must have flipped his vote, my initial reaction was, well, no, he was already going to get there. But then I realized in talking to the justices right after that, that no, he did change his vote. And so when I went into this project, I realized that you know, a lot had happened behind the scenes. But when I found out about the Medicaid switch, which nobody had known, I was like, oh my gosh. And then I, I needed to test it with people. Because you can't just, you find out something from one source. And even though you think, oh my gosh, I can't believe nobody knows this, but I know it. You don't, you need to, you need to find out whether there's, you need to verify it. You can't just verify from one person, no matter how inside that person is. And that was hard because I didn't want anybody reporting something before I knew it. But I remember calling one of the lawyers who was involved. And fortunately, there were many lawyers involved. And you can guess who it was, but I'm not going to tell you. I remember calling one of the lawyers who were involved. And I said, and then he switched his vote in Medicaid. And there was this gasp. They're like, <laughs> you're kidding. And then, because it seemed so unbelievable. But then when you st step back and you realize, at oral arguments, Breyer and Kagan were so firm about what they believed about that, then everything started to make sense. And I went to many of the justices. Um, I interviewed a majority of the justices at the time of the decision, and then a majority of the justices uh, as I continued to work on, to do the book. And I, I actually had to go get somebody inside to check a vote count, because I thought, I just need more reassurance on what happened on Medicaid, because nobody had hinted at that earlier. Yeah. Well, let's open up to questions. Bunny has the microphone there, so raise your hands. And, and you, you know my statement, which is, we're Jeopardy. So put your comments in the form of a question, please. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask about the juxtaposition of a president uh, who promotes racist public policies mm -hmm. and and justice roberts who uh has been interested in narrowing racial remedies have you arrived at at any sort of uh judgment about where he might draw the line or or what might be going too far for him you know it's interesting his attitudes on um racial remedies. This has been incredibly consistent from the start for him, that he thinks they do more harm than good. He's written that. He said, you know, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. He, he believes that. He believes that things uh, like campus affirmative action uh, are debilitating to uh, racial minorities. He argues heatedly against Justice Sotomayor as, you know, just one example. And he has never changed his view on that. And his, his idea is that that is what's been embodied in the sort of colorblind ideals of Harlan's dissent in Plessy. And he, no matter how many of his colleagues, even his colleagues at the center, Justice Kennedy, who's argued with him on some of this, they, they got into a very um, strong disagreement on the, the reach of Brown v. Board of Education in a 2007 case called Parents Involved. Schools were the chief. Plans based on race. And Justice Kennedy, who, you know, a Reagan appointee, a conservative, but more toward the center, said there's just so much more to do in America on issues of integration in schools. And so you're, you're just reading it wrong. But he has, he has not wavered. Now, President Trump has pushed harder on racial and uh, ethnic issues. 
And I, um, I'm sort of having a reaction formation against that as he, had, you know, kind of going in the, uh, inching away from someone like Donald Trump, as I know he's doing in other areas. I don't see it happening so much on race, but we'll have some tests of that with, um, uh, some of you might know that the Harvard Affirmative Action case that's percolating up, initiated by Asian Americans who feel like they've been um, on the short end of the stick from um, uh, affirmative action programs that traditionally benefit uh, African Americans. And, and so it's, um, again, I think he's not, he doesn't subscribe to the views of Donald Trump, but he has very firm views in this area. Yeah, would you like to hear? Yes, I'd like to get into the dirt. Um, <laughs> Did uh, the Chief Justice speak about the Merrick Garland nomination and tell us a little bit more about the mistrust and the divisions uh, that you saw arise out of the ACA? Um, I, can tell you, I can tell you, I can't tell you what he said about Merrick Garland, and I, and I can't tell you, uh, he wouldn't talk, he wouldn't give me anything to use on the record for the ACA, but I can tell you this. John Roberts said nothing publicly during the whole more than 400 days that the court had that vacancy um, before um, Neil Gorsuch was confirmed to it. He said nothing from, you know, the March 16th, 2016 date that Merrick Garland was nominated to the end of Obama's term where not a single hearing was held. And actually, he has, while he would not subscribe to Merrick Garland's approach to the law. He does have the same background as Merrick Garland, and both of them actually were clerks to Henry Friendly on the uh, Second Circuit, and he knows him a lot in a very professional context. So um, there are things that John Roberts has said about uh, protecting the institution of the judiciary, but he did not talk about that delay. And then on the Affordable Care Act, that was just the most obvious case where I found, I was very surprised when I started my interviewing about what I was learning from justices on both sides, especially when I started hearing from other conservatives about how they were so, that they are suspicious of him. You know, he has this natural sense of reserve when he's with them. He can sometimes be, this was, an, I, and I, I sense that. I sense that he would have, nat he likes to keep his cars close to his vest. Everybody said that about him, so I knew that. But I was surprised at um, some of the things I was picking up about how he could be dismissive of his colleagues. Some of the um, remarks that might, as I said, be dismissive is sort of a, a gentle word for snarky sometimes, <laughs> seriously, you know, that would be said. And I would, you know, I didn't know how to use that because I didn't, you know, nobody was going to say on the record. And then he, you know, he made fun of me this way or that way. You know, I, I wasn't going to get that. But I felt like it, I should at least suggest it enough. And I don't do it a lot in the book. It's a small undercurrent in, in the Affordable Care Act chapter and in a chapter I called um, The Fractured Court, where the, some of the disagreements involving Sonia Sotomayor burst forth, and then this one, toward the end, you see this very public um, disagreement uh, that he had with Justice Breyer, again, over something that um, they didn't need to raise the temperature so much on. And it's, what I, what I write in the book is that uh, these, these tensions are real, they're real, but do they affect final outcomes in cases? Probably not. They affect, you know, who might sign on to a concurrence, who might be willing to negotiate or compromise in a particular case. But in terms of the law of the land that we all live under, I, I don't think they're substantial. And it's an interesting switch because I think he presents himself as right. a kindly, genteel, gentlemanly person. Right. Um, and then, but now you hear this behind the scenes. Um, whereas his mentor, Chief Justice Rehnquist, could be very pointed, as you know, on the bench and, and even one-to-one -one, um, with a graduate student, for example, who interviewed him, <laughs> who shall remain nameless. But, um, but then when I remember Justice Brennan being interviewed about him, said, oh, he was so affable. We, know, we, all, right. we all love Bill Rehnquist. Well, here's the thing. John Roberts suffered by that comparison. They did. Justice Ginsburg still says, oh, and my chief, referring to Bill Rehnquist, and John Roberts says, I wish he'd stop that. You know, like, <laughs> she, the correspondence that, uh, that I found of hers in um, uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist's files uh, out at Stanford at the Hoover Institution were priceless. I mean, she is so, she's crazy about him. <laughs> and, you know, and look at, look at where they stand on the law, where they stood on the law, you know, opposites. But he, I think they saw him as, 
irrespective of what he believed, you know, the court that was in the Constitution or a federal statute, that he was a fair dealer and that he just felt like you just, everybody gets to cast their vote. I'm not going to try to manipulate things the way, you know, his predecessor, uh, Chief Justice uh, uh, Warren Burger, was known for. And they appreciated that. They appreciated that. And the other thing is, when I was talking to Justice Scalia early on about the comparison of the two men, he said, you know, Bill Rehnquist had enough years in to toughen his hide. He wasn't as self-conscious about his leadership because he had been an associate justice for 14 years. He knew the internal dynamic. John Roberts came in without that experience at all. And I, and I think that so many of us discounted that because John Roberts exudes not just that that kind of genial exterior, but he also ex exudes such competence. And confidence. Yes, right, seemingly. right. Yeah. yeah. Question back here. Bert? Colonel yes, uh, thanks very much for your presentation and your book. Uh, it's a great read. Um, I did have a question about uh, some of the intrigue that you go into in the behind the scenes in the court. Um, it has been rumored that um, Chief Justice Roberts uh, is inclined when he is in the minority on a particular case and shopping for another vote that he might go so far as to offer uh, to one of the other justices in order to gain um, the fifth vote, offer the opportunity to write the, uh, write, write the ju uh, judgment on that particular case. Um, have you been able to come across that um, at all, or do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, he, he would negotiate, he would bargain with uh, the, the authorship of an opinion, or, but the, here's the thing, he has assignment power for anything where he ends up in the minor, majority, of course, and what you're suggesting is that he would be, he would start in the minority, but he'd want to woo somebody over. And if, he, but naturally, if he would, let's take Justice Kennedy. If he could woo Justice Kennedy over, it would be such a narrow ground that the ultimate decision would be on that he would rightly want to kind of keep the opinion with that person with that narrow ground. So I don't know if, I, I was not able to document any specific instances that you're talking about. And his, um, going back to um, Warren Burger's era, People would often talk about how he would withhold his vote until he saw which side was going to win. And then he would, he would say, I'm with them, so I get to control, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't, see, I don't, I don't know of him doing that, but I, I would believe just by virtue of him having a very strong stake in how a case comes out and a very strong stake in how the court's opinion is presented to the public, that he would try to... Um, he would try to work out um, um, concessions from people and offer something in return. But I don't know of any specific examples of what you're saying, though I, I know that, um, again, he doesn't have the reputation that Warren Burger has, but he has a reputation of um, at least be trying to be very aware of how something will be presented to the public and maybe working in sequence with cases if we, if we do this in this case, maybe we'll do this in this other case. Which again, like with the Affordable Care Act, might end up being better for the country, but isn't exactly calling balls and strikes. Right. Right. Yes, and then Steve will come to you. I really enjoyed the book. It was fascinating. Great, um, and I've been following the court for a long time, you know, as a hobby. But the, the thing that struck me maybe more than anything was when you talked about um, that one of his friends had said he's really an introvert who's learned to act like an extrovert. Well, I, I understand that. And I'm just wondering if, if that sort of dynamic could be at the root of some of these, you know, distrust and everything, because he's, he's essentially a different person mm. than he really is in public, it seems to me. Do you, you know, do you think I think that's a fabulous observation because, you know, here's the other thing. You sort of wonder, as, as people are griping about the man who's chief, you know, in, in my interviews with other justices or, or, or law clerks, 
you're kind of like, you know, who, who's, whose lens should I use here? How can I understand what's going on? And I actually think that's true, that he, he might not always realize how he's coming across because he's, he's, he's had to become this very public person, this manager of people who are all appointed for life, all who think, you know, people would say, oh yeah, he's certain he's the smartest person in the room. Well, so are, you know, like a lot of them think they're the smartest person <laughs> in the room. You know, like, that, that's no fun. You know, like, so that, you know, so I do think it's, it, the one thing I've, I, I, have, I have thought in, you know, cutting him slack in various ways is that uh, this is, these are not easy jobs to uh, try to, first of all, reach consensus and reach agreement, but then also smooth out the egos and try to build trust. Uh, but it's, um, it seems to be a, a dilemma for him. And the, the remark that you made about uh, it, the, the idea that he is a, an introvert who's learned to act like an extrovert came from a man by the name of David Lebron, who's now president of Rice University, who was the president of the Law Review when John Roberts was the managing editor for it. They were at, at Harvard together, so. Yeah. Steve. Yeah. Okay. Um, this may be a short answer, but in your discussions with him or with any of the other people you interviewed for this book, did you get any sense of a... Supreme Court, his position on that? I, I think, first of all, that he does feel the historical weight of his office. Even before Justice Kennedy had left, he had said that, you know, he is, he is a student of history. He did indeed think he was going to be a history PhD at one point, and um, be a, a history professor. But he, um, he has said publicly, you know, you don't know whether you're going to be regarded as John Marshall or Roger Tawney. You certainly don't believe you'll be the first, but you definitely don't want to be the second, you know, kind of thing. So he, it was Justice Kennedy who um, help promote the idea that justices don't vote automatically as their, as their presidential benefactors, you know, because he, he swung in the middle. And, you know, John Roberts has now famously said, there are no Obama judges, there are no Trump judges. And to prove it, he will need to inch a little bit to the left. And I believe he already has in small ways, very, very small ways. On abortion, I think it would be very hard for him to be leading a court that outright overturns a 1973 landmark Roe versus Wade. But would he vote to roll back the right? He already has, certainly. He has been um, in favor of more restrictions on abortion, both you know, when he was an advocate for the George H.W. Um, Bush administration, but even as Chief Justice, he has voted against um, abortion rights. And he, but just last, in February, on February 7th, he voted on the liberal side to leave in, uh, to block a Louisiana statute, that, uh, regulation that was about to take effect that was quite restrictive, um, that was like one that he had voted against in Texas. So he, but again, that was just an order. It wasn't a decision on the merits. It wasn't a, that big of a deal. So I can see him maybe around the edges, even on reproductive rights, moving a touch to the left. But I, and I also think I'm unlike many some of my colleagues. Some of my colleagues think Roe v. Wade is definitely going to be overturned outright. I, I'm I just need more evidence from the court on reproductive rights right now to see where they're really going. And they've been sitting on a series of pending petitions that involve abortion that they just have refused to take up. They've refused refused to resolve one way or another, and they seem to be trying to buy time or just avoid it for right now. We have time for just one more question. I'm sure, though, that when um, Joan is out at the signing table that she'll be happy to chat with you. Yes, ma'am. I'm in the middle of reading the new biography on Sandra Day O'Connor. And it's um, very clear that the court was a very different place when she went into it. Can you talk a little bit about now that there's so many, well, there have been so many women on the court, how things have changed in, in, that, uh, in the court itself? Well, you know, when she came on in, in 1981, all eyes were on her as first woman. Uh, so, in, you know, obviously we've had uh, three appointments since, and we have three still there. Uh, so it's changed in terms of, you know, gender identity, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg says, we'll be fine once we get all nine of us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but the other thing that's changed, and this will tie it all up in terms of you know the court atmosphere that some of you have asked about. Just as Sandra Day O'Connor was the social glue of that place. She got them to have lunch after all their oral arguments. She was always planning field trips for them, and she was just going to make sure that they all liked each other, you know, come hell or high water. You Junior know, League. It's Junior League experience. She was so, <laughs> and, and well, I would say it was also her legislative experience during her 25 years. And that's what, in my book that I wrote about her, I regarded her not so much as first woman, but the legislature, yeah. the politician on the bench. She knew how to work a room. In fact, she knew how to work a room in a way that, frankly, the others really don't. And the chief doesn't because she was, she knew that you had to give to get, to give to get, you know, like she got it all. And she also knew that people could not walk away humiliated or, you know, made to feel like they couldn't say face. That was, you know, she, she got that. She's the ultimate she got extrovert. That. Yeah. And I, when we would take teachers there to the court, and they, we, they, we would say, now you're going to meet Justice O'Connor. Don't worry. She will meet every one of you. She'll circle around the room. She'll shake e each of your hands and she will use your name in a sentence. She's, That's the ultimate yeah. politician. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for raising uh, Evan Thomas's new biography of Sandra Day O'Connor. Um, if you would like to come on May the 3rd here in this room at 5 o'clock, we are holding the 21st annual Henry J. Abraham lecture, and Evan Thomas will be here to speak at 5 o'clock. This is, uh, we call it private in that you won't see it on the Miller Center uh, schedule, and therefore you don't have to register for it. So it's just a little bit of a different process, but you're all welcome to come at 5 o'clock May the 3rd in this room uh, to hear Evan Thomas speak about Justice O'Connor. So with that, um, we also want Joan to be able to exit, so if you'll let her go out first to the table, but before she does that, please give her a rousing thank you. <laughs> Wonderful.